Hi, I'm Senator Stan Kucher, and I recently introduced a bill in the Senate, Bill S-251, to repeal Section 43 of the Criminal Code, which uh, permits the defense uh, for corporal punishment of children. That means the defense to be able to hit children. Myself and many other people uh, do not agree that this should be in Canada's criminal code as a defense, and that we think that children have rights, and that includes the right not to be hit. We're going to hear from two experts in this area today. The first is Dr. Joan Durant. She's a child clinical psychologist and a senior scholar at the College of Medicine at the University of Manitoba. She's published scads of articles and done a deep dive into the research of the effects of mild corporal punishment on children's health and mental health outcomes. The second is Cheryl Milne, who is the director of the Aspen Centre for Constitutional Rights at the University of Toronto and who really, really understands all the legal issues related to Section 43 and the hitting of children. I look forward to hearing from both of them to help us better understand the issues related to the necessity to repeal Section 43 of the Criminal Code of Canada. I first became interested in the effects of physical punishment way back in 1990 when I was a new child psychologist and I'd be asked by parents whether spanking would help their children or harm them. And I wanted to give them an answer that was based on research, not just my own opinion. So I started to read and I haven't stopped reading for the last 33 years. To Right now, what I would like to do is present a summary of what we've learned over those three decades. A large body of research has been built over those 30 years and the studies have become highly rigorous. They've used longitudinal designs and sophisticated controls and several large meta-analyses have been conducted. So as I talk about this research, I'd just like you to keep in mind that this is based exclusively on spanking, or in other words, the everyday forms of physical punishment that are currently permitted under Canada's law. I've organized this summary of the research into negative and positive outcomes, and I'll start with the negative outcomes. What we know is that spanking consistently predicts more disruptive behavior problems, higher levels of aggression and antisocial behavior, and not only in childhood, but right into adulthood. Spanking predicts higher likelihoods of teen dating violence and adult spousal violence. It also predicts lower levels of moral internalization, and that refers to the, the taking in of the parents' values. Children who are spanked are more likely to be uh, motivated by external rewards and punishments than they are by that internal sense of feeling what's right. Spanking also predicts impaired social and emotional development and mental health problems and poorer parent-child relationships and slower cognitive development. It also predicts physical injury and fatality. So the literature is very clear that spanking consistently predicts these outcomes across countries, across methodologies, across child ages, across measurements, and with a variety of statistical analyses. So these findings are highly robust. Why is this the case? Well, a number of things happen when a parent hits a child. First of all, the child sees a model of solving conflict with aggression. There's no doubt whatsoever that children learn through modeling. We know this. When a child sees a parent hitting in response to conflict, that then becomes part of the child's repertoire. Second, the child misses that opportunity to see another way of solving conflict. So every time a child is hit, another healthy learning opportunity has been lost. Third, the pain focuses children's attention on themselves. So they learn how to act to avoid punishment rather than acting pro-socially. 
Fourth, the feeling of threat that the child experiences alters the brain. MRI studies have now shown that spanking changes children's brains, particularly in the areas that are involved in self-regulation. So it's not surprising that we see impairments in social behavior and emotional development because the regulation systems of the brain are being compromised. So now let's look at the positive outcomes. There are none. Not a single study has found positive long-term impacts of spanking. Not one. There's no longer any debate in the literature. Even the normative or everyday forms of physical punishment constitute a major public health issue with long-lasting impacts and high costs to society. Now, some people listening might be thinking, but I was banked and I'm okay. And that might very well be the case. But the odds of you being okay were much lower than they would have been if you had not been spanked. This is analogous to seatbelts in cars. When I was a child, seatbelts didn't exist. And then research started to demonstrate that not, that not wearing a seatbelt predicted a greater likelihood of injuries and fatalities. So we did all we could to encourage seatbelt use because we recognized the public health risks. Many children, like me, were never injured. But many, many were, so we took action. And we passed laws to make sure that everyone knew what the standard was. So now let's turn to injuries and fatalities. Many people ask me, so is spanking abuse? And I really see that as a semantic discussion and it's um, very, it doesn't really get you anywhere. What we know empirically is that the two can't be separated. They're part of the same phenomenon. Three cycles of the CIS, or the Canadian Incident Study of Reported Child Abuse and Neglect, found that most substantiated physical abuse is punishment. It's not random actions by parents. It's attempts by parents to punish, correct, chastise their children, and the child gets hurt. A large Quebec study found that children who are spanked are seven times more likely to be severely assaulted. So why is this the case? Well, once a parent starts hitting, the stakes have been raised. If the child can't comply or won't comply, if the parent has self-regulation difficulties, if the parent is tired or stressed, one slap can quickly become a beating. So if we as a country continue to tell parents that some level of spanking is okay, we're placing their children at risk. They need a clear, unambiguous message that will help them inhibit that first impulse to strike. So what difference does legislation make in that process? Well, actually, it makes a very important difference because it tells our society in a very clear way that hitting children is simply not permitted. So there's no gray area. There are no ambiguous messages to try to sort through. At this time, 65 UN member states have done this. They've abolished their criminal defense. And two nations, Scotland and Wales, and 16 territories have done the same. And 27 more countries are fully committed to law reform in the near future. Canada is not on any of those lists. I've studied the impacts of law reform in several countries, and I want to share just two findings from New Zealand, which is a country very much like Canada that had an identical defense. New Zealand repealed its defense in 2007 and fully prohibited all corporal punishment of children. Over 10 years, the proportion of parents who physically punished their children in the previous four weeks declined by almost half. Now, why did that happen? Did that happen because they were so afraid that they were going to be charged and prosecuted? Well, actually there doesn't seem to be evidence that that is the case. 
the number of prosecutions actually remained very low and steady over five years of monitoring by the police. So these are the number of events every six months or so that the police were called to that would qualify as what they called smacking, the, the, mo the lowest level of physical assault. So you can see that the, the number of incidents that they attended to increased at about halfway through that period, but the number of prosecutions did not. So it wasn't that the country was gripped by fear of being pulled into the criminal justice system. What happened was that the message became crystal clear. Changes in parents' behavior and attitudes were the result of a higher level of awareness that came with the law reform and a societal shift in the definition of acceptable parenting behavior. In 2018, Canada became a pathfinding country in the global campaign to end violence against children. Just since 2018, nine more countries, you can see them on the slide there, have joined the list of those prohibiting corporal punishment, while Canada, the pathfinder, has stood still. We hit children because it's a bad habit, not because it helps them grow and develop. It harms them deeply, and it affects our entire society. It's based on entirely outdated notions of how children learn. And it's now time for Canada to step into its leadership role, rather than continuing to fall farther and farther behind on the pathway to end violence against children. So hi, I'm Cheryl Milne. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the legal, the key legal issues um, that surround our defense and, our, and the Canadian Criminal Code called Section 43. Um, I came to this as a lawyer um, representing the Canadian Foundation for Children, Youth and the Law when we launched a, a constitutional challenge against this section now almost 20 years ago. And as Joan has outlined, the, we, we have had quite a change or development over that time to really solidify some of the arguments that we made at that time. But Section 43 of the Criminal Code says that, that parents and persons in the place of parents and teachers are justified in using force um, for the purpose of correction, so long as it is reasonable under the circumstances. And so uh, while the Supreme Court of Canada back in 2004 found that that section was constitutional, they also thought that they could define better what reasonable under, uh, under the circumstances was, was. And so they, these are some of the things that they tried to do. They said it was an objective standard, not based on the subjective views of a judge. It's focused on the correction of the child, not the gravity of the precipitating event, which means we don't look at the nature of the child's behavior and determining whether it's reasonable. The child must be capable of learning from the correction, which means that in some of the cases that have been decided subsequently, so uh, if a child has, for example, uh, a developmental disability where it's difficult for them to learn or they're in a, um, a um, an estate where they are having a, really a lot of trouble regulating their emotions, that, that that's not a time that you can use physical punishment but that the standards are, are to be based on the current social consensus. And I think the argument can be made now that the social consensus actually is that um, the mild form of physical punishment that the court found to be reasonable, which is the spanking that um, Dr. Durant is talking about, is in fact um, no longer something that we have a consensus as being acceptable. The other aspects that really make it kind of confusing, I think, for the public, because if you look up the criminal code and look at section 43, all of these circumstances are not set out there. You have to go to a Supreme Court of Canada decision. So it's very difficult to communicate and educate um, parents about what they can and cannot do and where the line is. Uh, everybody thinks what they do is reasonable. Um, they don't really think about all of these different factors. But um, primarily the, de the definition says that only minor corrective force that is transitory or trifling um, 
Not sure that that's everyday language that people would understand. It also says that children between the ages of two and 12 are the only um, people that uh, are the only young people that can be hit um, or can be finished physically punished under this section or or can have force used on them for the purpose of correction, whatever all of these terms mean. Um, Unfortunately, there are still quite a few cases involving teenagers, so it doesn't really make sense, and there's inconsistency in how that's been applied, even for teenagers. Um, one of the reasons that they they um, came up with this sort of upper age limit was that the the studies that we presented in the court at the time showed that um, that the use of physical punishment on teenagers was counterproductive. Uh, in other words, when when many teenagers, when they are threatened physically, will fight back. And so it just seems like it, it seems like maybe a logical reason why you wouldn't want to hit teenagers, but it isn't something that is really consistent with the whole purpose of the section, quite frankly. It's also the, the behavior is not supposed to be degrading, inhuman, um, or harmful. And and that those are really kind of broad judgment calls as to what fits into those those categories. Because I think um, what we now know is that most use of physical force for the purpose of, of correction or punishment is in fact harmful, just because of the outcomes of the studies that, that, that they've heard about. Um, the the dis definition says no use of objects or blows or slaps to the head. Um, and that this, And then this last category, which is really the most difficult to really kind of understand how we apply that in everyday circumstances is that it cannot stem from a caregiver's frustration, loss of temper, or the, the court said abuse of personality. But it's very rare that a caregiver um, um, doesn't resort to the use of physical punishment when they're um, when it's a situation of frustration or loss of temper. That's pretty a com pretty common um, for that to coincide um, with the use of physical punishment. So who does it apply to? Well, parents, and they're they've been defined in subsequent case laws, someone who takes on a sort of a robust parenting role, not a temporary caregiver, um, not other kinds of people that work with children. Um, some cases have allowed delegation to a step parent, but they have to really be fully in the role of parent before that can be accepted. And the court really clearly said that teachers cannot use physical punishment, um, but they can use sort of minor force to restrain or remove a child in appropriate circumstances or to secure compliance. So who doesn't, um, does this not apply to? Are people like youth workers who work with young people in, in group homes or in care settings, um, other kinds of people who are not necessarily teachers who may be working with children? Um, it doesn't apply to them. So it's a very narrow uh, application. And one asks whether um, this is really necessary, because um, I think you know what we can see from these other settings is that you can work with children um, and discipline children in the sense of showing them how to behave um, properly without resorting to hitting them. It's also something about the fact that we have it, that this is a, a, a defense that only applies to children. We have very many kind of situations in which this very broad definition of assault in our criminal code, which is really any non-consensual touching, could, could technically come within the definition of, of an assault. Um, we have lots of examples in which within families or or even just with amongst people that you know that where you have minor touching that's not consensual that would never be considered an assault. So for example, you're crossing the street with a colleague at work and they go to step in front of a car and you grab them by the arm so that they don't um, hurt themselves. That's an assault. They didn't consent to you doing that. Um, but, uh, so, but there is no circumstances in which a police officer or even the person who's received of that, who received that, that physical force against them would want you to be charged. So we have a very strange kind of um, narrow um, set of circumstances that just set, that is really set up to perpetuate this notion that children should be hit to learn. Um, we also have like, if, if what we're trying to do is to prevent, um, to sort of, shield the family and sort of put a protective bubble around the family, which is somewhat of the, 
the reasoning in, in the, um, the, the Canadian Foundation case, we have lots of situations in which assault with amongst family members could be technically considered a criminal offense. So between teenage siblings, for example, or a sibling that, that or a, a child that hits a parent, and we're talking about even mildly, it's technically assault. But, but there are lots of reasons why um, the police would never lay a charge in some of those circumstances. This is an example of a case um, in which um, a mother had slapped her, their um, their child in the head. So if you read those definitions given by the Supreme Court of Canada, you would think that a slap um, in the face or a slap it to the head would be considered unreasonable and therefore wouldn't meet the test for, for what is reasonable under the circumstances under Section 43. But the court found the mother in this case not guilty because it was a minor slap. So we can, we can see that even now with the current definition, things are not clear for people. We don't really know what, what crosses the line. So the other thing that, that, is quest that we get questioned about is if we remove Section 43 from the criminal code, what happens? Um, are we going to have um, you know, a major sort of uh, sort of, uh, incident where we have parents now being vulnerable to criminal charges on an ongoing basis? And the answer to that is that there are other criminal defenses, both in the criminal code themselves and what we would call in our common law, which means it's based on the cases um, that have developed. And we will have continuing development of that common law um, as we live with a situation without Section 43. So under the criminal code, there are defenses for persons acting under a particular authority. Um, so people who have a particular role to play can use some force in order carrying out their legal duties. And so teachers could be in that particular set, um, set of circumstances. You could also um, use, there's other defenses. Section 27 is, talks about the protection of others. Section 34 is about the protection of yourself. And uh, Section 36 is about the protection of, of property. You can prevent offenses from happening. You can prevent someone from hitting you. You can also prevent somebody from hurting and harming someone else and use force that is reasonable. Again, it's always got to be a reasonable standard, but but these are for for kind of um, behavior that one might be worried about if a child is out of control, for example. So the kinds of things that, that, that were described in that earlier slide about what teachers can do under Section 43 are covered under these other defenses and are covered under sort of, sort of common sense and the common approaches that people have so that you can, if, a, if, if two children are fighting on the school ground, a teacher comes in and breaks up that fight, then they in fact have the um, you know the protection of these criminal code defenses. They have an obligation to look after these children, and so they would be seen as carrying out their duties. Um, there is also some case law to say that there is a deemed consent, um, which is that there there's not an actual express consent, for example, for infants um, for, to be diapered or to be put have their their winter clothes put on or to be put in a car seat, but that this is nurturing behavior. This is behavior for the safety and care of children, especially young children, that we have a common law defense of de deemed consent. And the case law um, has, even though the Supreme Court of Canada hasn't pronounced on it, there have been other judges that have done so. And then there's this, this Latin phrase, de minimis non curat lex, which really means that the, the law is not concerned with trifles or minor incidents. And it has developed uh, um, along with the, our rather broad um, assault laws. So that very minor touching, so you brush against somebody, um, the slight tap to get someone's attention, those kinds of behaviors are, are considered de minimis and the, the police won't lay a charge. And part of the analysis that goes into, and there's case law again that supports this, is that you really look at the public interest and whether or not there's a public interest in, in proceeding with a conviction, a charge even. So the, these things are considered in many steps, but so the police may not even lay a charge on a de minimis kind of case. Um, if they did, if they felt that there was enough evidence um, and maybe the evidence wasn't clear and you only get the full story once you're in court, um, when it still comes out that the evidence is that this was really a minor touching, then um, the, the court can find that this is de minimis and, sh and not, not to be 
there ought not to be a conviction because it's not in the public good. It's it's um, it's it's the kind of behavior that you don't want to um, attribute criminal sanctions towards. So that goes into the analysis of what is a de minimis. Um, and then finally, there's the the, the um, defense of necessity. So that would be similar to the grabbing somebody from running out into the street. So many people use this example, what if my child is going to run out in front of a car, shouldn't I be able to use force? Well, yes, but that would be within the category of necessity. You had to, you're responsible for that child, you you had to do that to, to protect them. So, so um, when are assaults prosecuted? As I said, it must be in the public interest. It requires a reasonable prospect of conviction. So again, the, 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 the analysis of what was going on at the time is, is really important. And it really, for the de minimis defense in particular, you look at um, like non-trivial um, and intentional and motivated by hostility. And there's, there's case law to suggest that where there's an intention to cause some kind of pain, which is the case of physical punishment. It, there's, there's no that that is what is what is intended when you strike someone intentionally that it may be maybe minor pain that you're wanting to and um, to assert but but to, it still could be some kind of pain that's the that's the situation where assaults can be prosecuted so the other thing is that how our our law operates is that um, you know it takes a number of steps and a number of um, people with good judgment um, that, st that step in to make those the, the calls. So someone, first of all, has to call the police. In most situations in the family home, that's not going to happen. The police have to consider charging the, either the parent or the teacher with assault and, and consider that to be in the public interest. And the Crown, then, who prosecutes these cases, has to believe that there's sufficient evidence to demonstrate a reasonable likelihood of conviction, as I said. And finally, that the judges ruled that the, the person's actions were harmful and worthy of sanction. So each of these have to occur for, um, for a, a prosecution to, to really go forward. And finally, the other responses that, that uh, I think are important to consider are education and diversion. So if a case is seen to be even worthy of prosecution and even potentially a conviction, there still are methods of diversion so that you're actually educating the parents um, rather than punishing them. And we do have a lot of, of examples of that for very minor crimes that are nonetheless crimes where we divert them out of the criminal justice system. In some cases that means steering them, if it's serious enough, steering them towards child welfare and child protection services, which can be coercive and frightening for parents, but it also um, can help fulfill a prevention and educational function. If, if it, if, um, th this is part of a systemic plan to help uh, parents parent. Um, in uh, Wales, one of the places that uh, uh, has outlawed um, spanking and has um, eliminated the defense, they have established prosecutorial um, guidelines about when you actually bring in the police, when you actually defer um, diversionary um, responses, um, and just what kind of behavior come within the purview of the assault that, um, laws. They have also made sure that there is a whole education component as the law was coming in so that parents are made aware that this is what's happening. That parents always have a choice not to hit their children. Um, we are right now in a very strange um, situation where our governments are telling parents how to hit their children, um, saying, well, this is what Section 43 says, and this is how the court has defined it, and giving them kind of a list of, of this is what fits within and without um, the definition. It seems to be that it, what we should be having is a better conversation about why you should not be hitting your children at all, and that only can take place if we, get, we eliminate Section 43. Um, Joan, if you have anything to add to what I'm saying, because you've looked at some of um, these other jurisdictions like Wales and, and seen what they've done in terms of, of effective ways to address um, the physical punishment of children, absent this kind of defense. 
Yes, in in countries that have done this, it hasn't been done in a heavy-handed, top-down sort of way. We're going to tell you parents how to raise your children. That's not what it's been about at all. It's been about making the law clear, just as it is for every other citizen of the country. So I know that nobody can hit me. I know that my employer can't, my husband can't, my child can't, no, my friends can't, no one can hit me. But if I have a two-year-old, I can hit them. What these countries decided was that it was just simply, obviously, extremely unfair <laughs> and very, very dangerous. So to not protect the smallest and most vulnerable people, that just didn't make any sense. So they decided it's time that we ensure that everyone in the country is protected. And that's just the right thing to do. At the same time, they said, we realize that parenting is a very, very challenging task. It's very stressful. It's exhausting. And parents don't have a lot of support or information in, in many countries. And so they implemented um, various types of supports. I think the Wales is a great example. They, they set up things like summer road shows where they would send um, people out to supermarkets and, uh, you know, outdoor markets and various events to uh, give advice to parents, to give them support, to let them know we're here for you and to give them information about the law so that it was very clear, no hitting. Um, there, uh, most countries that have um, passed laws like this have um, really done a lot to make sure that the, the parents are aware. As that's one of the major purposes of law, not just this one, but most laws. So I might be tempted, for example, to take an apple when I'm at Sobeys. But because I know that's illegal, I inhibit that impulse. I might get very angry with my coworker and want to shake them or slap them, <laughs> but I know that's illegal. So I inhibit that impulse. And if I'm a parent where that urge is not uncommon, most parents have felt it to, to hurt their child. Rather than saying, in this country, that's okay. And then letting that escalate to an injurious level, rather than telling them that's okay, we need to tell them it's not so that they have that standard in their mind to inhibit that impulse. The law is very important in the regulation of behavior. So we need it for that, and we need it for education and awareness raising. We need it as a launch pad for parent support and education across the country. Um, and we need it to simply recognize that children are human beings and deserve as much protection as any adult has. It's also very confusing for parents, especially if they encounter the child welfare system, because even though the Supreme Court of Canada in its defining of what was reasonable suggested that what they thought was reasonable is not abuse and is not something that would lead to um, child protection involvement, we've actually seen, and I know this is some of the research that you have done and some of the, the incident studies that have been done across Canada show that that in fact, that's not how it's defined. And in fact, that kind of minor force that's supposedly still excused and not considered abusive under the criminal code is deemed that to be that way by child protection authorities. And there's good reason for that because um, you know, the criminal code can talk about one incident of, of assault, but if, what if that incident takes place over and over and over again in a day. So it's mild spanking, but it it's 20 times or even every day for what, you know, that that child is subjected to that. And that could be seen as an abusive situation. So, and and parents will then say, well, I have this right to hit my child, but but because um, the criminal code says I have the right, but child protection authorities are saying, well, no, we still think that that you shouldn't be doing that. So it's very confusing for parents. And I, I do think that some of the, you know, sometimes the argument is, well, what about sort of um, some of the families, marginalized communities will be um, sort of the, too much attention will be brought to them. They're the ones that are going to be prosecuted the most. And the reality is, is that to some extent they already are through the child protection system. 
because of this confusion, because we are saying on the one hand you can do this, on the other hand you shouldn't. And to be and back to what you were saying is if the law is clearer, then it becomes easier for parents to navigate what they should and shouldn't be doing, as opposed to getting caught up in a system that they don't understand. Yeah, I agree. I think these mixed messages and gray, fuzzy areas and attempts to totally decontextualize these actions puts parents at risk right now because the law is telling them it's okay. And then it, it's not. So they're, they're being told things that could get them into a lot of difficulty. So the clearer the law is, the less likely it is that parents will be drawn into the criminal justice system and into the social welfare system because the line is clear and they're not being given mixed messages. Also, I do a lot of parent education and it's very difficult to do that when the law says it's okay to hit your child. All of the efforts that parent educators and psychologists and physicians and social workers put into trying to encourage and persuade parents to not hit their children because they know of all the harms, that it's all undone by a law that says it's okay. Uh, we're, we're really putting not only children but parents at risk and we're not moving forward into an age of nonviolence. You know, I, I think that there, our current country's big focus on gender-based violence is something we really have to give some thought to. We're trying so hard to end this scourge of gender-based violence, of intimate partner violence, of dating violence. And we know that one of the contributing factors is physical punishment in childhood. Because when my parent hits me, I learn that's an appropriate way to solve conflict. And I miss an opportunity to see another way, to see communication, to see respect, to see listening, to see compromise, to see all kinds of things that I should be seeing, but I've lost that moment and I've been hit. So that's what I learn is the appropriate way. And we know that the more people were hit as children, the, the less they see it as a problem because they don't have a vision of what the alternative way of life could be. So it becomes normalized. And so I carry that with me then into adolescence and into adulthood. And it is without a doubt a contributing factor to gender-based violence. So I think it's very difficult for a country to say we're combating gender-based violence, but we're gonna still let people hit their children, which is socializing them into violence. So um, I think that that's a, a very important thing that we need to consider. But what, what are we, it's not about this two-year-old having a tantrum in the moment and me feeling out of control, so I need to be able to spank them. That's not what it's about. It's about how we socialize children, how we bring them into a way of being that understands how you interact with other people without resorting to coercion and violence. And we can only do that if we really strongly encourage parents to learn how to do that. And we support them in doing that. And we make sure that that mixed message is gone. And on a final note, just it's finally time for us to respect children in this way, because it is one of the, I mean, it's the only group in our society that we're allowed to assault. And uh, it is, um, doesn't treat them as, as actual people and with dignity and respect. I'll just end by giving a short little anecdote about that. In 2004, my son was six years old. And when I heard the Supreme Court's decision, I said, here's the good news. We can't hit babies anymore. That's the good news. It took until 2004, but we could no longer hit babies. And his response was, but who's going to protect me? We completely lost sight of who these people are that we're talking about. This is about the children who are living their lives in homes where they're being hurt, they're being harmed, and we need to stand up for them and we need to tell them as a country, we respect you and we will protect you.
Well, thanks to uh, both uh, Joan Durant and Cheryl Milne for the presentations. I hope that you enjoyed them. And uh, I hope that um, you've become interested in this issue. And if you have, I would encourage you to write to my office. Um, just put my name down in Senate of Canada and it'll come to us. You don't need any postage. And telling us why you think that we should work assiduously through Appeal Section 43 of the Criminal Code. 